of the fisher tropics synthesis and processes, uh, particularly things that have been happening in the 1920s, 30s, 40s and 50s and how they led up to the developments that you see now in the GTL industries um, and the fish tropics industries and the capitalist developments uh, of today. The first speaker is uh, Mark Dry. He's going to talk about the iron catalysts for fish tropics, particularly the past. Mark's background, at the moment still professor of in chemical engineering department in the University of Cape Town in South Africa. Um, before that, he was our colleague at Sasol for over 35 years on the Fisher Tropics process development, um, catalyst development, and the integration of Fisher Tropics uh, in the bigger uh, GGL and factories of the Sasol organization. Mark? Thank you. Well, as far as iron capitalists go, you can say it all started in uh, 1973. Then, gentlemen, Fisher Tops used alkalized iron turnings at a very high pressure and temperature, and they produced the oil, but this oil was mainly consisted of oxalates, presumably mainly alcohol. At that time, the main interest was the production of liquid hydrocarbon fuel. So, they lowered the pressure. And then they did make hydrocarbon oil, but unfortunately the activity was uh, considerably lower, and furthermore, it declined the time on street. Now, because of that, they shifted away from iron and towards the more active capital. They could control, they could sue the bandits, they fought about methane, and well, this was dealt with later by 1973, before the nine German operating plant operating, maybe no pressures for that However, the work continued on iron gases, the fission space, um, and the key developments really were the realization that alkali promotion was a key factor in the whole business. And also, when Pickler raised the pressure to 50 bar, he found that the activity not only was higher, but importantly, the light was now much better, so things started to look up. Now, of course, at the start of World War II, the coal supplies from Africa were cut off naturally, and therefore they started looking at iron very seriously, and there were six organizations which developed six different catalysts. And the idea being to replace coal, and these tests were carried out the so-called Schwarzheide tests in 1943. Now, I'm not going to go into many details, this list of firms and their catalysts. Um, they all operated with the same conditions that of course deliberate. They were all promoted to K2O, but the various firms used different promoters and different levels of different promoters. And in spite of all that, the interesting thing is that as far as the C6 plus yield, which you can say roughly is the uh, indication of activity, despite all that difference, these two were a bit lower, but these four are pretty much the same. There were differences in the wax selected here. You know, um, but none of these captures were ever commercialized because the, the war came to an end. Now, the Bureau, Bureau of Mines did something similar in that they, they, com they compared their own precipitated captures with a rural chemical precipitated captures, and again, they found pretty similar results. They compared the urine fused captures with the typical US uh, synthetic ammonia captures, which ended up being pretty, pretty similar to the normal fused captures used. And once again, there was no huge difference in uh, activity. The Bureau of Mines and Handicapped was quite a short So that's just the old work. Let me talk more general about how you said about making the line capital. Uh, as far as the source of the iron is concerned, as long as the iron source is free of the obvious poison, it can be used. The Bureau of Mines, in fact, tested various captures made from frequent grade, hematite, gold scale, glucite, cinderite, and with appropriate promotion, they all perform pretty well the same. So there's no magic in about a particular iron source. You can make a decent capture as long as the iron is uh, very fairly pure. Now, part of the precipitation methods used, I think uh, the Germans originally, and the large scale, simply decomposed iron nitrates. Of course, they're not very really stable. 
and then precipitation became popular. Once again, iron nitrates is the preferred source. Chloride and sulfates are pretty obviously uh, not good. They're all highly regulated. In fact, sulfates will always end up as the uh, sulfur compound in the So nitrates, stick to nitrates. Now, the problem is with the precipitate caps, you need a certain degree of strength, especially in a thick bed. And so you can use the either cemented catalyst, which you combine with the movement of borax, or you can sinter it in fairly high temperatures, or even if you really want to cut catalyst, you can fuse the oxide. Now let's look at the uh, industrial catalyst used for the high temperature process. They're all fluidized bed reactors. The old Granville plant, Granville oil, and it used fused magnetite, which is a local ore mined in the USA. The Moscas plant in South Africa uses Brazilian ore. And of course, on Tuesday, it converts to magnetite. The two completely separate ore from North and South America. Sassel, on the other hand, we started off with uh, so-called element ore important from the state, but we soon realized that it was crazy, so we went and started investigating uh, magnetite produced from the milk scale from the plant just across the river. So, we use milk scale at such. Now, those are the fluidized catalysts, which all use fused catalysts. <coughs> and in the low temperature process, we either have a fix or a slide rate reactor, and for that, we use precipitate motorized catalysts. Right, so I want to just get into a little detail about the preparation of fuse line catalysts. Um, the promoters are added during the fusion step. First, the chemical and the so called structure promoter, the key promoter is used in the in whatever niche. At the carbonate, it's more than just a skater roll of the desert carbonate in there. Then you add so called structure promoters, which can be alumina, magnesium, chromium, this kind of thing, and they are there increase the surface area of the final reduced cap. Right, now you choose the animal and then the cool, you make the trust the ingot, then you produce the ingot of uh, a bone material of the Now, just to give you uh, a so what the concept is as far as structural promoters is concerned. Say you use an alumina as the structural promoter. The idea is that if the, after reduction, you should end up with little blobs or crystallites of alumina interspersed between the iron crystals so that the iron crystals cannot touch one another. Right? And therefore, sintering should be at least partially inhibited. It just won't be perfect. The idea is to have these aluminum blocks as space to prevent direct contact between the neighboring iron crystals. That's a concept. Now, you can say, well, how do we get this wonderful dispersion of the aluminum in the uh, magnetite? And the, the answer is obviously you choose something that is capable of going into solid solution into the magnetite structure. In other words, take uh, aluminium. Aluminium Fe plus is smaller than Fe. Aluminium three plus is smaller than the Fe three plus, which it displaces in the eye, which it actually substitutes in the structure of magnetite. Therefore, you would expect the uh, unit cell size as the film of X-ray refraction to decrease. You can see the more aluminum you have, the smaller it is. And we did this with various things like the manganese is a larger iron, and if it displaces the Fe2 plus, it will make the manganese thing shrink. So this indicates uh, whether or not they are going into solid solution. Now the manganese, the magnesium, you can say, well, this is the dubious. Is it going into solid solution or not? So that's difficult to say from here because the magnesium 2 plus iron virtually the same size as the Fe2 plus R. Okay, the proof of the pudding lies in the surface area that we create on promotion with these things. And as you can see, the magnesium in fact does promote the surface area considerably. So obviously it has gone to use a solid solution. And there's the aluminum, and there's a whole bunch of other things. These things down here are silica, and the aluminum simply do not enter uh, to the magnified lattice, and therefore they have to play no role. You can still say, well, that's not good enough. You want to know what is the iron surface area of all the total area might be just a bunch of aluminum. This is the actual iron surface area as determined by CO chemical option. Now you can see once again there's the magnesium, there's the chromium, there's the aluminum. All the good positive components. These ones down there don't seem to do much of a job. Okay, 
All right, let's discuss the precipitation, the uh, separation of precipitated ice caps. Um, this is the way Rurikimi did it, and we had our <coughs> system of Tassel. It was pretty well the same, as some, except some of our minor variations. You take a, a, a metal micro, a high nitrate uh, solution, and you acidify it, you keep it in the nitrate after it doesn't uh, hydrolyze, and you add it to the sodium carbonate. You get precipitate, which you wash, you get rid of all the sodium ions, and you re-slurry, add a bit of potassium water glass, and a bit of acid, just to get the ratio of potassium to the silicon right. Then you either spray dry with the slurry, if you are making the catalyst for the uh, slurry reactor, and you then all you filter it to the dry for the uh, pitch paper. Now, amongst other things, the pore size distribution is obviously important for diffusion of acid or for diffusion of acid. And there are several things that uh, we investigated and we found that solution concentration, temperature of precipitation, the order of precipitation, and even the final pH all influence the pore size structure. Um, I'll just give you two examples by, by way of illustration. Uh, in this case, we did the normal thing, we added the, the iron nitrate to the carbonate solution. And this is the sketch now. This is the volume of nitrogen as well. Those of you know you that the ET is also as well. This is the uh, saturated and saturated partial pressure business. Now, this is a typical curve we get when there's a wide distribution of four sides. However, when you reverse the precipitation, add the nitrate to the carbon, you get this shape. This means up here, there's actually no pores larger than a specific uh, value. So this is a narrow pore size distribution, and, it, and the wider pores are virtually absent. So you can see uh, it does can be quite important. And here is an almost extreme case. Um, this is a point. This is now normal precipitation. We've added the nitrate, the carbonate, but in the first case, which is similar to the one I've shown you, with the final pH is 7. But here you can say that you can say, well, we deliberately added a little too much of the acidic iron nitrate, and the pH finally ended up too. So you can see what a tremendous effect of that. The structure goes to collapse if the area is low, you can judge from this 1.3 uh, area is considerably low, and it had virtually no big pore whatsoever. So one would suspect that this capital would be a bad choice uh, because uh, of the fusion problems. But Fisher drops. All of these drop processes have a huge limitation. Uh, you make the better smaller activity increase. So a clear indication that the fusion is important in the process. Right, so coming back to precipitation, and uh, this one, the agents, just a couple of examples. If you use sodium hydroxide, you get an average pore size of about 2.9. If you use sodium carbonate, it's somewhat higher. This is not unique just to sodium. You get the same phenomenon when you use ammonia. You get a larger pore size, average pore size, when you use the carbon. All right, I mentioned it's also silica promoted, and as you would expect, the silica itself will increase the area because the you know, precipitate silica has a higher area, but the idea of silica addition is there as a binder and also as a support or a space. But as you can see, as you increase the silica content, Around the iron, both the area of the unreduced and reduced increased part. If you look at the zero case without silica, the final reduced cap is 20, 35, 20 grams. But if you add uh, rather 50%, you can well, just, just increase all that much. And you can see you go towards the almost a three fold increase. Whether you need all that area is another question. Alright, let's come back to uh, fused magnetite type of catalyst. Um, after I have prepared, you now have to reduce it in hydrogen. And this just gives you an idea of the relative uh, rate of reduction at fixed foundation. We took 400 degrees C for 8 hours. When you use pure hydrogen, you get an 80% reduction in that time. If you only have 2% CO present, there's a marked reduction, uh, reduction rate. Use a hump. If you use CO alone, you only 4%. So reducing the CO or gas containing CO, in other words, some gas, it's not a good idea to, to, to reduce uh, fuel capital. You need a decent level of about 
about 70% of legislative years to get a decent activity. I'll come back to this level a bit later on. The message there is that carbon dioxide is not health pattern that you want to reduce to run capital. Um, as far as the conditions of reduction, uh, in practice you have a recycle, and of course the recycle is never dry. In the laboratory you can see very pure hydrogen, and nothing but this gives an indication of the initial reduction rate uh, against the ratio of water to hydrogen, and this is time to happen, so this is a, these are small factors. Uh, the effect of a little bit of water vapor on the reduction rate. And you can see how markedly it comes down as you have just a smith, smattering of water vapor in the tree. So the, the message is use as dry hydrogen as you can. The difference between these two uh, curves is this is uh, a aluminum promoting cap, it's a structure curve, and this one has got half the amount of aluminum. So, so there are two factors increasing the rate of reduction is the promoter and the amount of uh, structure promoter and the dryness of the hydrogen that is used to reduce the gas. Now, this is a very general, the whole bunch of different cactus here. Yeah. Not the aluminum, the magnesium promoter, various promoter cactus here. Yeah. Just to show you that there's a tremendous relation in any event between the final surface area and the initial reduction rate. This, this year represents the initial reduction rate. So the, the faster a thing reduces, the lower the final area. I suppose this is not surprising. Uh, the aluminum impedes mobility and therefore it impedes symmetry. And reduction rate. Alright, let's switch over to precipitated catalyst. Um, in this case, partial reduction is satisfying. Uh, the precipitated catalyst being finely derived and having a high surface area will obviously reduce fast. So that it's not so important to do a full or even a 50 or, or even a 30% reduction of the cap. The remainder of the reduction will occur in the reactor itself quite rapidly. Just to get pure hydrogen reduction, if you have no <coughs> promoter silicon present, then the reduction occurs very rapidly, uh, as you would expect to find in the right ion oxide. But if you have a silicon promoter, then it markedly slows the reduction. I presume there's some silicon. Iron silicate present that uh, holds things up. And therefore, copper is added, this is well known, the copper is added to enhance production. Now, as I mentioned, the, the level of reduction is not that critical. In fact, you can reduce the synthesis, synthesis gas, or you can reduce the CO, and you can get quite satisfactory performance. Some people claim they're better, some people claim they're not better. I only point out what they is they do, you do get sufficient reduction to end up with a satisfactory. <coughs> not of interest, but I wouldn't recommend for fixed bed reactors, but I wouldn't recommend reduction inside the actual FT reactor because there is this initial reduction, even though it's only 10 20 percent, it's considerably shrinking. So pre-reducing the capital is made sense in the sense that you can uh, effectively have a load more mass into your reactor. All right, now we change the subject to the control of selectivity of iron capitals. Iron is a very versatile capital, um, and you can shift the selectivity over vast ranges. Um, you can play around with the main factors, I would say, are temperature, gas composition, partial pressure, the same thing, and comfortability of the uh, capitals. This is where the, the uh, chemical composition comes in. Now, I'll show you the next two something to emphasize the fact that I would simply be using R wax or beta and selectivity as parameters. Um, whatever the process in fission crop, there's always a very tight interrelation between the different crops. This is the situation in the low temperature process where the objective is to make wax. And if you plot the hard wax, so that's the material boiling about 500 C, mm -hmm. you plot that against all the other components, you can see their clear cut interrelation. That means it's the gasoline. This is the medium wax, that's the medium wax, and so on. The same goes for the high temperature process. The very more convenient to use methane as the parameter. Uh, and here I've got methane again in the various categories. The gasoline, there's a C3, C2, and all that. So from now on, I'm simply going to say uh, what is a 
can show you what the wet liquid is or what the defense liquid is, and, and, and then sort of, sort of give you an idea of what the overall is. Right, let's kick off the temperature. Um, for the low temperature, the wet producing process, if you increase the temperature, not surprisingly, the wet production decreases. In other words, it's higher, so it quickly shifts towards a lower molecular mass product. You can go in a theoretical, you can talk about heat of desorption, the endothermic process, so you increase the temperature, you can increase the desorption, they can change, don't hang around so long, they desorb from the surface. Probably the change goes to the other. I don't know what you're worrying about the theory. Right, HDFT, high temperature process, increase the temperature, and <coughs> the methane increases. Once again, it's effectively it shifts towards the light product. Right, uh, let's look at the gas composition and I'll separate the low temperature process from the high temperature process. Um, this is the hard wet selectivity against the total heat hydrogen CO entering the reactor. It doesn't matter what uh, feed that you use it because the recycle might influence this, uh, the gas composition. This is the gas actually entering the reactor. So if you very much through or <coughs> or with recycle operation. This is the total feed hydrogen CO ratio. Now, for this particular set of experiments, we didn't only fiddle with the hydrogen CO ratio. We changed the pressure from about 10 bar to about 60 bar. And in spite of all those variations, and we fiddle around with CO2 as well, added CO2. But in spite of all these variations, you can see all you need to do is the hydrogen CO ratio. And for my money, that's a reasonable correlation for all practical control purposes. So all we need to do is control the hydrogen CO ratio of the gas entering the reactor. Right, now if you would do the same thing for the high temperature process, and once again we can emphasize here, we did some crazy things here. We varied the pressure from 30 bar to 75 bar. Um, we varied the hydrogen CO ratio of the feed gas. And several of these points, about three of them, we only CO2 and hydrogen. In other words, any CO had to come by reverse formulation. And in other cases, we deliberately added additional water. Now, you know, the process, of course, makes water, the product. But here, we actually added water to the process just to have all kinds of variation. Now, if you've got the hydrogen CO ratio, you want to just the shampoo. There's no correlation in my opinion whatsoever. But take the same data points which I've just shown you. And correlate the defense that we're doing with this factor here, and all those points now put much more strength. So obviously in the case of the high temperature process, the high deposit pressure is not so important. You know, this factor simply lowers its effect, CO, CO2, and water vapor all play a role. And you can interpret this as competitive absorption, um, of course chain growth to uh, increase, obviously you need some sort of uh, for, uh, you need a lot of CO on the surface, whether you go by insertion or CH2 model, doesn't matter. The more CO on the surface, the higher the probability of chain growth. But now you've got your, uh, this, is, this is one of the factors that involves chain termination. But hydrogen has got to compete with all these animals to get to show you on the surface. And therefore, I think, uh, and so all those partial pressures have an impact. Anyway, that, that is the situation. Right, now uh, what's important is the alkalinity of the surface. Iron cactus needs uh, an alkali promoter, unlike coal, which doesn't seem to be required. Right. Now, the alkalinity you have determined depends on the, obviously, on the uh, amount of alkali you have, it depends on the type of alkali, it depends on the chemical interaction of this alkali with other components that may be present. And then there's the what I said before, a dilution factor. Let's simply look at the level. Incidentally, these numbers have been disguised, so I don't get too excited about them. Um, <laughs> except the zero is zero. Um, <laughs> this is the low temperature process. If you increase the KPO content, the half wax increases half. For the high temperature process, if you increase the alkali content, the methane drops half. Now, when the methane is up in the 40%, you make no oil whatsoever. No gas in. So obviously, it's a bomb stop. But just a bit of alkali makes a world of difference. And these are low levels. Surprisingly, how little alkali is required to do the job. Okay, next, the type of alkali. We investigated many years back. Uh, this is 
is on the precipitated catalyst, which is the low temperature process. We looked at lithium, sodium, potassium, and rubidium, incidentally. Um, these are on the same, they're all on the same amount on an atomic scale, not just on a mass scale, on an atomic basis to, to promote. By taking K is equal to 100, then lithium is 40, and sodium is 90, this is the activity. So you can see lithium is hopeless. Sodium is much better than potassium, so it's the best to lock. The medium pieces that they were slightly weak, but even the, the racks in the different ways are so, so long chain, it can give us a few. However, as far as the half tax we go, the order was once again uh, in increasing in the order of alkalinity of the alkaline cell. So, we need a strong alkaline to do a decent job. And what about the chemical interaction? Um, silica is a typical case. Uh, if you promote an iron catalyst uh, with silica and potassium, the potassium is not only going to go and sit on the iron, it will also make it up to the silica. Right. You have here an unsupported catalyst of precipitated oxide S. This is the silica <coughs> that's completely unsupported. If you want to have 40 percent hard wax, you only need 1.7 units of potassium. However, if you have a normal level of silica support present, you need a lot more alkaline to get to the same level. So you can see the interpretation is that silica combines chemically with, or at least part of it, combines chemically with the uh, potassium potassium, and you form potassium silicate, which is less basic than if you're uh, potassium oxide or carbon. But this is a similar example, but here I've changed things a bit. This is for the fuse catalyst. We kept the alkali level fixed, and we varied the silica ratio. Uh, this is, say, a fairly low silica content to iron and both scale ore, and the activity was 85, selectivity so by 10, with the low potassium ratio, nice and high. If you add a little more silica, and uh, so that you get press the ratio of 0.24, the activity suffered, the methane suffered tremendously, and therefore the entire product spectrum went towards the right side, and you made very little low So, you can see how important the alkalinity is, and how important it is that you are aware of the fact that the alkali can react with other components present. Now this is slightly different, I've termed this dilution for direct and lack of a special word. We use a standard catalyst, uh, uh, iron, silicon iron convertible K with copper K and, and supported on silicon. Now this is the base case for this is that catalyst there. Made 34% hard wax selectivity under rigid conditions. Now, in addition to that, we also added the precipitation of all of these various things. You can see the whole bunch of different oxides. And if you look carefully, all of them, except the aluminium, is all about 30 plus or minus 1. So there's a slight effect, negative effect of dilution. Now, the fact that these Different animals all produce the same result once in trying to think, well, it's probably not chemical relations, but actually it might be the same field. It's probably just a dilution of effort. If you add this, if you impregnate the alkali onto the highly high area of catalyst, these alkali are not only going to go and sit on the uh, on the flooring or the key the door or the couch, but it's also going to sit on the eye. I'm sorry, although it's not only going to sit on the eye, it's going to sit all sit all over the place. So you effectively dilute it. The tent aluminum was significantly low. And one can say, well, really, in this case, it's not a matter of dilution, it's a similar effect as was the case for silicon, to form potassium aluminates, I presume, and they are less basic. Now, uh, the old work that was mentioned this morning, so I need to go on this. Uh, nitriding, no zero mine work, they did find the nitriding iron had some beneficial effects, higher activity, more resistant, low free carbon shifted to low mole weight product, and of interest is also the, the shift towards alcohol. In general, if you want to make more alcohol, the, the feeling one gets from the literature is um, you need, alcohols are, I think, I'm pretty sure that alcohol is fine in If you look at the dynamics and the, the product selectivity, uh, you think, well, alcohol must be a primary product. And uh, to increase the alcohol content, you need to operate, uh, since it's a private product, you don't want to hydrogenate or dehydrate or whatever as a secondary reaction, you need to operate a fairly low conversion level 
out of a short version of this diagram, we have the fit, which we have converted. Uh, you want a high pressure, both of hydrogen and steel, and you want to go into the possible reason for this. Uh, well, oxygenate is probably produced by CO insertion. So obviously, you have a lot of CO pressure, you're going to get more CO insertion. But you've got to get that animal off, so you're going to hydrogenate off. So you need to go higher than that CO. Uh, high alkalinity and nitrile cap, all that. Right, now we will spend the rest of the time on uh, activity decline. Um, the first one I've got down here is not really activity decline but time of stream. All fish cross cutters, whether it's high temperature or low temperature, you want to have, have wax inside the pole. Don't keep yourself with wax in the high temperature pole of iron cap. And this is down to uh, restrict diffusion. So it will lower the activity, not just the result of decline. The other factor Powering, poisoning, hydrothermal synthetic oxidation, and three problems which I want to discuss in detail could well be factors in activity decline. And let's just firstly address the, the first one which lowers activity. As I said, there's always wax in the pores. And you say, well, let's get rid of that wax. So in a fixed bed, uh, not in the study, obviously, in the study, we're all full of wax anyway. But in a fixed bed reactor, you can periodically online extract the wax. Online, and the temperature we actually did this a few years ago, and the Germans have done it before. Or alternatively, you can periodically <coughs> online give it a hydrogen reintroduction. Now you have to stop the synthesis to to reduce it. And both of these remove the rats out of the captain part. But the results are short lived. You can see there's the activity, there's the treatment, it jumps up, and within a couple of hours, and you all rest, it's back to normal. You can go through the various cycles. So extracting the rats certainly improves the fusion and increases the activity and it doesn't seem to be affected the population. Uh, this is the study we did on activity time on the fixed bed reaction, low temperature precipitate iron cap. What we did here, we ran the same batch of capitals, separate batches of the same batch, um, for in the reactor for different times. This is a, just a week or so. This is several weeks, and this is after a long period of time. Yeah, and uh, we then took, sorry, describe this first. We ran this 50 then. Then we unloaded it, we, we, we kind of reacted very carefully. We let samples starting at the entry, which had to be the bottom, right at the top. So 20 or 30 samples were taken. Then we took each sample individually and measured its efficient crop activity. And you can see these are the results. For a young catalyst, there's not all that much difference from top to bottom of the reactor. As the catalyst, the uh, longer and longer time, the front end dramatically dropped. And so did the uh, back end start the end, and then also the tip. The positive didn't change all that much. So what's the explanation? We then analyzed, not only did we measure the activity, we analyzed all the samples for what we measured the BET area, we measured the, uh, the X-ray X -ray refraction, to determine the visibility uh, and the phases, and we also analyze the sulfur. Now, this is the result just of the area, this is of the, the, the old capital. The old capital is the highest area, which is the top of the reactor, where it was still dead. Remember, let me go back to this one. Is that sulfur now there? So, obviously, Loss of area wasn't the reason for the loss of activity. We analyzed that sample and found high sulfur content. I mean, high means just half a percent, but that's quite enough to kill a cap. All right, then you look at the, the other end, you say, well, here the area is low, and the activity is also low at the end. The X-ray analysis showed us that there had been oxidation, which is not surprising, that's where the partial pressure water is at the highest, but also there had been crystal growth. From <coughs> so the, the uh, carbide had hydro, they had been hydro synthetic. So you can say, well, in the case of the catalyst in the back, uh, cat activity loss is due to hydrothermal sintering as well as uh, oxidation or one or two hydro. And then in the one in the middle, of course, you didn't see the sulfur and it sort of an unreasonable condition, so uh, it didn't deactivate so much. Now we um, come back to high temperature process. And uh, you often find 
statement in the literature that three carbon poisons catalysts. Now, I'm not convinced of this. Let me give you, say, why. If you use a take a catalyst which has been operating quite a while, which is a fluidized high temperature process, and you analyze it, you will in fact find on an atom basis more carbon than iron. Right? And yet the activity declines not significantly. This conversion has dropped to 2%. But if there's more carbon than iron, you can expect a higher decline in activity if, if it is really a uh, poison for the core. Right, now I believe it's an indirect effect, or the main factor is the indirect effect. The more carbon you deposit in the catalyst, the lower the bulk density, and the, the, the higher the loss of alkali rich, the active fine kind of react. I'll come back to this uh, at the end of my talk. I think it's an indirect, indirect factor due to the bulk density problem. Just to explain a carbon deposition very briefly, I don't want to waste time here. Um, this is the carbon, this is the boudoir reaction, we separately different, uh, different promoters. Uh, this is the rate of carbon addition per gram of iron. And you can see alumina at the bottom tremendously fast, it comes with calcium, tremendously slow, that's the standard. But if you translate the data to the rate of the position per meter square of, of metal surface, they all pretty well fall in the same line. So what I'm saying here is, uh, The rate of carbon deposition seems to depend on the available iron surface area or iron carbon. Of course, there's no iron metal to get carbon out of the area. This is simply a carbon deposition rate. Now, this is under synthesis conditions. Uh, these are the two different catalysts. This is a high alkali catalyst and this is a lower alkali catalyst. So the obvious first thing I want to stress is that, unfortunately, for producer crops, the higher the alkalinity of the catalyst, the higher the rate of carbon deposition. You want alkali because you want a uh, you want a good selectivity, but you have to then put up with a higher rate of uh, of carbon. Right for that cat. Now this factor here is uh, let's just call it a three carbon deposition factor. So the carbon deposition rate for a particular cat is proportional to the phosphate zero divided by the phosphate pressure line to the power two, and that power two is very important. Now. This is a type of high pressure unit. And we have the opportunity to build reactors, and we are seeing that's a high pressure, I would say, to make use of that. In this case, we did a series of runs, 31 bar, all up to 76 bar. We used the same, fed the same gas, uh, fresh feed, but when you increase the pressure, in order to keep the linear velocity inside the reactor the same, in other words, we had fixed residence time, we also increased the amount of feed the reactor, right? Now, so the hydrogen zero ratio stays about the same because the percent conversion actually stays the same. You feed more, you, you double the amount of gas, you still get the same percent conversion. And let me just cover this. Because we increase the amount of gas fed, because the amount of fission top work, the amount of product pouring out of the reactor has gone up virtually in proportional to the pressure. But the carbon deposition factor has in fact dropped and in agreement with that, the actual carbon deposition rate is gone. So here you have the case where you are making more carbon, but in spite of that, carbon deposition is actually lower. And if carbon deposition is a direct or indirect factor, then one should go for high pressure operation. You can have your design and costs and uh, what it's worth to do. Alright, now coke time. On high temperature process, we really believe there is some, let's call it code. Um, how we determine this is we took a huge catalyst, chopped it with a huge catalyst, then solved the extract the sample step one. First with heptane, and then uh, after you, you still off the heptane and the residue you analyze for hydrogen carbon, and this is the atomization, 1.7. So already you can see uh, the heptane has, has extracted some material which is not pure, but apparently it must be some aromatic. If you take that same sample, you get set to it, and the ratio goes to 0.9, then you go to pyridine, and it's 0.8. So obviously, you stuck, you're extracting your stepwise to kind of more and more aromatic. But that's not the end of the story. You take this sample that you've extracted as well as you can, you put it in a little reactor, and I did feed it in 350, and voila, you get lots of wax and oils and gases going off. So obviously, it's not the tough. 
how you call them, uh, they say call them issues, that is, and that surely must be found in the campus. So that is presumably one of the reasons of activity time and speed. Here's the situation of the, uh, once again, the high temperature process, how the analysis varies with time. And you learn iron metal, but that gets converted very rapidly to iron carbide, and then in four really right at the beginning, you get quite a big whack of iron oxide. And then it looks as though the iron oxide is increasing all the time. And it is tempting to say, ah, this is causing activity to climb. But I'm not sure about that. If you take a catalyst, whether it's young or old, and it can only be a few hours online, and you take a sample from the, the mixed bag, part of the size, and you uh, polish, have a polish section and do an X-ray EDX over it, you'll find that the smaller particles consist of carbide embedded in free carbonation. The larger particles have that same carbide uh, outer surface, but the inner core, and this is exaggerated, now that's not surprising. As you go in here into the, remember this is a porous part. As you enter, uh, the certain gas, the hydrogen is consumed and produces more of the vapor. So then as you penetrate, the system becomes more oxidized, so the core gets oxidized. Now this raises the question of why bother with the 100% oxidation and reduction of the catalyst in the first place, if you know within a couple of hours, you're going to have iron core and work. And to test this, we actually deliberately took fused iron capital and reduced it stepwise, 10%, 20%, 40%, and so on. And we found that the activity increased with a degree of reduction up to around 11, around 4, around about 6, after which it didn't happen. And this fits this concept. No point in reducing the 100%. The smaller part will, of course, be about this anyway, it's a matter of depth. Now, how come? It appears, we have got some time, take one more here, I'll finish off now, this is my last slide. I come back to this apparent decline in activity, and coming back to the carbon deposition problem. As you deposit carbon, you of course get abrasion, so you just you chip away at this material and form fires. Uh, this thing becomes weak, it also might break up. But being lighter, the smaller particles, having a lot of carbon at a low bulk density, the smaller particles being blown out of the reactor. Cyclone cyclone efficiency or 99.99 or whatever, but you still lose cat. And unfortunately, you also lose alkali rich fine. So continuously you lose alkali rich fine. This is specific on the speculated fluid I did, reactor. And because of this, uh, you lose activity, you lose the alkali, and you lose the best part of the cat. Then by difference, of course, the remaining stuff is becoming apparent. I, I oxide rich, right? It's simply because you're losing iron rich, a carbon rich material that the balance becomes oxide rich. And therefore, uh, it appears that there is continuous oxidation in time and speed. And I believe that it's mainly due to uh, the fact that we trade out the carbon rich part. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Mark, for sharing an enormous amount of learning over the last 50 years at least. And uh, it's good to see that you can still remember everything from the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> Mark, we have time for we have time for a few questions. Uh, Calvin? Uh, Mark, I wanted to ask uh, what kind of extraction you did in situ to increase activity and in remove the hard wire. Um I recall the you pump through Diesel or soft wax. Just pump it. You actually stop the synthesis uh -huh. and just pump through. This is a big bit. You, know, you just pump through a uh, heavy diesel. Okay. And uh, that extracted the wax. And that will say within, within a few minutes, an hour or so, an activity shoots up. It's very quite frightening. An activity shoots up and then comes out. So you can't really, in the long term, get rid of it. Yes, uh, yes. Uh, remember the, it should flush it so that the, you're almost making wax. So there's a, a flow of wax from inside the particle out. But I guess the longer chain waxes do stick around a little more. But, uh, okay, I think 
But that you should get a steady state of form, because we should end up in a steady state. The rat is coming out all the time. There shouldn't be a build up of poke because it's taking you through that. But if you remove the rat, then of course just for that short period, the fuel is dry. There's no rat speed feed in that or fuel. But then as soon as you get fish you can't bring the rat to produce it again, you practice for a while. I want to ask about the sulfur poisoning as well. Uh, at what levels PPM of HUS uh, were you treating, or what, what level well, was the catalyst? That's the standard uh, gas from the factory, which is typically 0 0.02 or 0.03 PPM or parts per billion. Anyone can know? I think it's EPM. PPM. And, and you're not able to get that to lower levels? Uh, wouldn't there be some advantage to doing that? No, it's very difficult. The rate of salt process is, is filtered. You can't remove that to the uh, final pressure. The oxide, there won't be much better. So you, you are talking about maybe 20 parts or 200 parts. Well, it sounds like 20 parts. No, no, no. Quite close to a million. Are, are yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Very good. I mean, it's commercial gas can be stored, I suppose. Question in the back? Okay. Yes. Um, when you were looking at all the different iron compositions, did you uh, do any study with uh, respect to the reactivity of the carbon layers with hydrogen? Uh, is it a You're going to put the carbon layers with hydrogen? Yeah. The, 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 you know, I, I'm thinking of the progression of um, the hydrogen treatments to the storing catalyst activity. I'm okay. curious if you've ever went into any type of on study to see if, uh, if the promoters or competition does have any impact on the reactivity of hydrogen on Well, I'll tell you, at low temperatures, you know that key carbon position, you just get back to where you were, as I demonstrated. But if you do this on the high temperature catalyst, you remove all the coke, and you burn off the carbon in your higher temperatures, your catalyst really, because in the end, if you use catalyst, the small crystals of I'm carbide is actually embedded in carbon. If you burn off the carbon, or hydrogenate off the carbon, then the particle size is all wrong. You can't then, it's not so easy just to reuse that cap. Particle is too fine. So you, it's just not worth regenerating. The very mild degree in both scales is a reject material from a steel bone, right? Regeneration is, we've looked at regeneration over many years. We can regenerate the cap. But it's just not worth the economic amount. Sorry, any questions? Quick, quick question. Yeah, very quick. Um, Mark, Hi. you said that you mentioned alkyl loss uh, uh, with fines. Um, How do we measure it? No, no. Alkyl loss with fines uh, during reaction. Yeah. How about during extraction? Sorry, Anna, what is extraction? Do you lose alkali uh, when you extract your carrots? No, not with the lower bit, no, because it, it's, it's selected. It's not making fines, uh, if you pump these out. The fines are only in the high temperature process where you have fine problems. Okay. Um, incidentally, if, uh, the the is is that if you look at the poly section of a few iron catalysts, there are inclusions of iron silicon, of potassium silicate. Potassium does not enter into solid solution, but I showed that mm -hmm. in the thing. So that potassium distribution is relatively poor. And in fact, if you look at the ground-up capitals, you see little blobs of potassium silicate completely separate. Mm -hmm. One often wonders, how the hell does it do its job? But still, it seems to creep around. And this is well established in ammonia synthesis as well. But the alkali on reduction seems to creep back onto the iron surface. But obviously, the, uh, this, the distribution is not ideal. Mm -hmm. uh, well, things are going to improve itself on that score. Thank you, Mark. Um, before we go to the next speaker, which is Calvin Bartholomew, uh, just a matter of housekeeping. There was uh, the last paper by Wolf Dekler um, has been replaced by a presentation by Steve Linus. Uh, Wolf Dekler was not able to make it to uh, the United States. Um, Second speaker is Alvin Bartholomew. He's going to be talking about the history of, our, of, of cobalt, Fisher Trops catalyst development. Um, Calvin is the, the Pearl Professor 
at the Catalyst Lab of the Brigham Young University in Provo in Utah. And now we look forward to looking at the other side of catalysis for peace and